The subject I'm going to talk about today is war and international politics. And this is actually uh, a talk I gave only once before. Uh, and it was the Richard K. Betts inaugural lecture at uh, Columbia University this past November. Um, and uh, I uh, uh, want to make it clear as I start that when I talk about war and international politics, I'm really talking about great power war. Uh, and it's important to understand that during the unipolar moment, which ran from roughly 1991 when the Soviet Union went down the toilet bowl until about 2017, uh, we lived in a world where there was a single great power, which was the United States of America. That's why it was called the unipolar moment. And if you live in a unipolar world, you can't have great power politics because there's only one great power. So you can't have great power politics uh, by definition. But we now live in a multipolar world. There are three great powers out there, the United States, China, and Russia. And we live effectively in a multipolar world. And that means that great power politics is back on the table. You can have security competition and you can have war uh, among those great powers. And I think the subject of war and international politics, great power war and international politics, is a subject you want to think long and hard about. It's a lot like nuclear deterrence. When guys like Mike and I were young, we knew all about nuclear war. We knew about nuclear deterrence. We knew a ton about great power politics because we lived in a bipolar world. It was dominated by the US-Soviet competition. The world that most of you grew up in was the unipolar world. There was one great power. You weren't worried about nuclear war among the great powers. You weren't worried about great power security competition or great power war because it was largely irrelevant. Uh, but uh, that world has gone away, and we're now in a multipolar world. And it's a quite dangerous world, as you have surely figured out, and it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Uh, but that's not my subject today. Now, the perspective I'm going to offer you on war and international politics is a realist perspective, as I'm sure everybody here knows. I'm a realist, and I'm a particular kind of realist. Mike and I have fundamental disagreements about how the world works, even though Mike is a realist. So you should understand that you're getting a particular realist perspective on the subject. Uh, now, my talk is going to have three themes, and I'm basically uh, addressing three issues. I want to talk first about just the essence of international politics. I want to talk a lot about the essence of politics. Two, I want to talk about the decision to go to war, when great powers decide to go to war, how they think about it. And then third, I want to talk about escalation in war. Okay? And let me just briefly tell you what the three themes are, because I'm a big believer it's very important to have a framework in your mind to begin with that you can then use to keep track of the various detailed arguments that I'm laying out. With regard to the essence of international politics, my first point, uh, I'm arguing that war is the dominating feature of international politics. It really matters enormously. Uh, it, in, it matters in terms of influencing how leaders think, and it influences how states interact with each other, whether you're talking about an actual war or the fact that war is sitting there in the background. It is the dominating feature. And therefore, international politics, I will argue at some length, is an intensely competitive enterprise at its core. Intensely competitive enterprise at its core. So that's my first theme. My second theme which actually runs against the conventional wisdom uh, is, and this is all about the decision to go to war, is that war is an extension of politics by other means. This is Clausewitz's famous argument. And it's a tool of statecraft. And it has little to do with ethics. It has little to do with morals. has little to do with international law. States go to war when they think it's in their national interest. This means, very importantly, there are two kinds of wars that are acceptable and to be expected in international politics, preventive war and wars of opportunity. 
that runs against the conventional wisdom, as I'll explain in great detail, in the United States of America and in the West more generally today, where those two kinds of wars, preventive wars and wars of opportunity, are ruled out of bounds, according to just war theory and international law. Right? And then the third theme has to do with escalation in war. And this is an argument that once you get into a war in the modern age, there's a very powerful tendency for wars to escalate to their extreme level, to their absolute level, to get total wars. Right? It's one of the main themes in Clausewitz. We don't have time to talk about this uh, today, but if I gave you a lecture on Clausewitz, this is written all over that book. He understands that tendency to escalate. And what happens when you get in a war with that tendency to escalate is that military considerations end up dominating political considerations. Remember, with regard to my second point, I said, apropos Clausewitz, war is an extension of politics by other means. That means war, military factors, are subordinated to political considerations. But the escalation argument is that once you get into a war, once you're in it, right, the powerful tendency that exists to escalate means that political considerations get subordinated to military considerations. And my argument is this is not good under any circumstances, but it is certainly not good in the nuclear era where you want the politicians, the policymakers in charge to make sure that that war doesn't spin out of control. So those are the three basic themes uh, that I want to develop in my uh, talk. Okay, so let's start with the first theme, which is that war is at the core of international politics. It, it, you want to remember here, what we're talking about is the relationship between war and politics. And as we go along here, you, you want to just think in your mind what war but more importantly, what politics is all about. You know, I never thought much about politics. And what, what, if you would ask me to define politics anywhere in my life up to the time I was about 68 years old, I wouldn't have known what to tell you. What is politics? You know, how, how do you define politics? How do you think about politics? You want to think about politics, what it means. You want to think about international politics. And then you want to think about how war and international politics are related. Right. These are big picture issues, right? So, uh, again, as you heard me say in my setup remarks, uh, that war is the most important feature of international politics, and it influences how leaders think, right? It's there all the time. It's constantly influencing them, uh, and it influences how states interact with each other, right? They're greatly influenced by this phenomenon. Now, my argument is not that we live in a constant state of war. Obviously, we don't live in a constant state of war, right? My argument is we live, again, we're talking about great powers, in a state of constant security competition. Great powers always engage in security competition. Sometimes it's more intense and sometimes it's less intense, but they always engage in security competition. And sitting in the background is the possibility of war. The United States and the Soviet Union competed constantly for security during the Cold War, and there was the ever-present of danger, danger of war sitting in the background. Furthermore, there is no question that war is an absolutely destructive and dangerous enterprise. Its horribleness is in good part what makes it so important. So I want to make it clear here, I'm not saying that this is a sport. This is like playing a football game. This is like playing the Super Bowl. This is a completely different kind of phenomenon. Incredibly destructive. Incredibly horrible. And furthermore, it's not only the fact that lots of damage, lots of destruction is inflicted on you in a war, or can be inflicted on you in a war. It's also the fact that the survival of the state is at risk. You never want to underestimate the importance of that dimension of the story. Survival really matters. But given how destructive war is, and given the fact that it threatens the survival of states, 
unsurprisingly, states have gone to great lengths over time to do away with war, to outlaw war, to figure a way to get rid of it. But you know what? They failed at every turn. They never got rid of it. And they're never going to get rid of it. It's going to be there forever. Right? So the question is, why is this the case? You want to think about this. Why haven't we been able to get rid of war? And I'm going to make two arguments. The first one, it has to do with the nature of politics. And the second is it has to do with the architecture of the system. This is the anarchic nature of international politics. So it's a two-part argument. This is why you can't get rid of war, why it's an ever-present possibility that sometimes manifests itself in actual fighting. There are two reasons. The first has to do with the nature of politics. And this is what I was imploring you to think about today and think about in the years ahead. This is what politics is all about. Politics, as Barack Obama right, and Bill Clinton said, is a contact sport. It's a nasty business. Politics is all about fundamental disagreements on first principles, fundamental differences about questions regarding the good life. And these fundamental differences that individuals or societies or states have are sometimes so profound that people want to kill each other. Just go back to the religious wars in Europe way back when, Catholics and Protestants killing each other in huge numbers, right? Just mattered so much to them. The abortion issue, an incredibly complicated issue. There are lots of people running around the, in the land who believe in or don't believe in abortion who would like to kill some people on the other side. It's a contact sport, right? These differences really matter. Look at the fights over Supreme Court appointments. Look at how all of these anti-Trump people feel about the possibility of him getting reelected. My wife is basically a Republican. You mentioned the possibility of Trump winning, and she gets mad at me. I'm not, I said, what are you getting mad at me? I didn't vote for him last time. I'm not going to vote for him this time. She's just so infuriated at the thought of this guy getting reelected, right? And by the way, there are lots of people on the other side. You get my brothers talking about Hillary Clinton. Oh, boy, right? I'm just saying, what you have to understand, the intensity and the enmity that comes with politics is not to be underestimated, which is why Clinton and Obama both said it's a contact sport. And I have a similar quote from Newt Gingrich in there, which makes the basic point. That's why to make politics work, you have to have compromises. You want to understand that there are no solutions to lots of disagreements about first principles, right? Just, there's just no solutions. There are always these intense agreements, disagreements, uh, and the question is, how do you deal with them? Inside a state, you know, inside the United States of America, inside Japan, inside France, you deal with it by creating a state. And that state protects people. It allows them to disagree, but it protects person A from an attack from person B, and vice versa. Right? So you have a state. But this gets to my point about the architecture. In the international system, there is no higher authority. There's no higher authority to protect these states, which sometimes have fundamental disagreements. So. What this says is you can't take war off the table. You understand? You can't take war off the table. Remember I said politics is all about the fact that you have fundamental disagreements between individuals, between societies, between groups in society, between states. You have fundamental disagreements. And those disagreements are sometimes so profound that A wants to attack B and kill it, right? You can't take war off the table because there is no higher authority. Inside the state, you can take murder off the table. You can take killing off the table in large part, certainly in those areas where the higher authority has presence. But you can't do that in international politics. 
And when you add to that the destructiveness of war and the fact that your very survival might be threatened, right, you can see where that leads you, right? Politics, right, is naturally an unremittingly competitive and intense enterprise. It's unremittingly competitive and intense. And that's inside the black box. That's inside the state. And then you take it out into the international system where there's no higher authority. And that competitiveness, that intensity, is ramped up even more. So my, this is my, sort of my basic point to start with, that when you talk about um, war in international politics, you, you, you can see where, given the nature of international politics, given the nature of politics and as it applies to the international system and the presence of war, you, you can see how those two things go together. And again, just bring in the survival motive, right? Your survival is threatened as a state. Furthermore, just the destructiveness that's involved, right? So, let me make my argument crystal clear by making three additional points. First is, I'm not saying that cooperation is impossible. You could have cooperation. You can have two states that are great powers that are competing with each other that can cooperate. Uh, during the Cold War, my favorite example is on the issue of nuclear proliferation. The United States and the Soviet Union both had a vested interest in making sure that there was zero nuclear proliferation. Uh, and uh, we took a while, but we eventually created a proliferation regime, really starting in the late 60s. The NPT was 1968. Nuclear Suppliers Group was formed in 1975. And we basically did a great job, the United States and the Soviet Union, cooperating to shut down nuclear proliferation in good part. Did we continue to compete at the security level? You better believe we did. Did we continue looking for every opportunity we could find to screw the Soviets coming and going? You better believe we did. Were we glad to usher them down the toilet bowl in the late 18, 1980s, early 1990s? You better believe we were. That's the way great power politics works. The United States is a ruthless great power. The Soviet Union was a ruthless great power. We never stopped engaging in security competition, which again is not to say you can't have some cooperation. You can have cooperation, but that cooperation takes place under the shadow of security competition. Just a quick word about international economics. If you think about international economics and you compare it with international politics, certainly as a realist like me understands international politics. International economics pays no attention to survival. It pays no attention to international anarchy. All these terms that we use don't apply there. They're interested in cooperation on a large scale. That's what globalization is all about. And the idea is if globalization works, everybody gets richer, prosperity really matters to them. Whereas somebody like me focuses laser-like on the concept of survival, they focus laser-like on the concept of prosperity, right? Cooperation matters greatly to international economists, right? Because they're not paying attention to survival. They're not paying attention to security competition. And they could get away with that during the unipolar moment because, again, great power politics was taken off the table. But we're back in a very different world now. Uh, so my argument is that when push comes to shove, international politics trumps international economics when the two are in conflict. Uh, my third point, I want to be very clear. I am not making the argument that great power wars are likely. That's not my argument. My argument is the great power war sits in the background most of the time, and great power war nevertheless has a profound influence on how states behave. And the reason that great power war is not likely dovetails with another point that I made to you folks, and that is that War is so destructive. War is so horrible. The fact that it is so destructive, the fact that it is so horrible, makes it very 
difficult to get states to initiate it, right? And what drives that, its destructiveness, is nationalism, industrialization, and the nuclear revolution, or nuclear weapons, right? Nationalism makes wars very destructive, right? Because you're able to create mass armies and you're able to uh, motivate those armies to hate the other, the other, a lot of otherness at the core of nationalism. So nationalism um, makes wars highly destructive. Industrialization, uh, all these weapons that are designed to kill people, running around out on the modern battlefield, with, uh, all these weapons that are highly sophisticated and maximize the chances they're going to kill you. Whoa. Right? So, uh, so a very industrialization. And then, of course, nuclear weapons, right? Nuclear weapons, they're called weapons of mass destruction for very good reason. So nationalism, industrialization, and nuclear weapons make war incredibly destructive. And that makes war less likely. You understand the point? It makes it less likely. But nevertheless, it makes it as important as ever because it sits in the background. It's still a possibility. That's the basic <coughs> argument uh, that I am making to you. OK. Let me shift gears now and talk about the decision to go to war. Okay, my second theme. You remember when Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war started, February uh, 24th, 2022. The Russians clearly invaded Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, basic argument is that uh, this war uh, was both unjust and unlegal, illegal. Uh, and uh, there's just no question that almost everybody thought that the war was wrong, the initiation of the war was wrong uh, and should be condemned. Now, why is that the case? It's because of the domination of a non causvitzian view, which says that international law and just war theory should dictate when states can go to war. And I believe that almost all of you believe this. And I believe that almost everybody uh, who's reasonably well-educated and has thought about this in the West believes that there uh, are limited times when you can go to war, or limited circumstances when you can go to war. And those three circumstances, and this is an argument based on just war theory and international law, is you can initiate a war if you have good evidence that the other side is about to attack you. This is called a preemptive attack, right? Mike is about to attack me. I can see that he has loaded up the shotgun. He's coming after me. And I just get in the first blow. So he's really initiating the war, even though I get in the first blow. That's a preemptive strike. That's OK, according to just war theory. That's OK, uh, according to international law, or most accounts of just war theory. Second is if we get a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, I'm unhappy with what Mike is doing. I go to the UN Security Council. I get a approval from the UN Security Council. Then I am justified in attacking Mike. Makes perfect sense. Fits neatly with international law. So the first case is a preemptive strike. Second case is a uh, UN Security Council resolution. And the third is that you're allowed to initiate a war, intervene, strike into a country if it's engaging in mass murder or genocide. Right. This is the idea of you see what's happening in Rwanda and you decide you're just going to send in the 82nd Airborne. You can do that, right? There's, you're acting according to just war theory. This makes perfect sense to all of you. The two cases, which I've already mentioned before in my setup remarks, where you're not allowed to initiate a war are, number one, a preventive war. This is not preemptive. Remember, I talked about preemptive is where Mike's going to attack me and I beat him. 
uh, to the punch. That's preemptive. That's okay. A preventive war is where I see Mike is growing more and more powerful, and I want to cut him off at the legs before he becomes too powerful. That's a preventive war, right? The second is a war of opportunity. This is a war where, you know, Mike and I are competitors, and uh, I'm thinking about attacking that person over there as a way of gaining more power so that I improve my position relative to Mike. That's a war of opportunity. It's an opportunity to acquire more power, right? Those are verboten. Preventive war, wars of opportunity. They're verboten according to just war theory and according to um, international law. Now let's just go back to Ukraine. The conventional wisdom in the body politic in the West is that Putin invaded because he was an imperialist. He was interested in gaining uh, more power for Russia, creating a greater Russia, right? It was a war of opportunity. The vast majority of people in the West believed that it was a war of opportunity, right? He was trying to gain more power for Russia, make Russia more powerful, make it a greater Russia, right? That was the argument. That's verboten, and that's why everybody criticized them. I argued, on the other hand, and now a number of others like Jens Stoltenberg, uh, who is the head of NATO, have argued this, that it was a preventive war. M my argument is it was a preventive war. He was not going to let Ukraine become part of NATO. He was going to prevent that from happening. So there's, let's call it the Johns, John Jens Stoltenberg argument. Right? And then there's the conventional wisdom. Both arguments are ruled out of court according to just war theory and international law. Right? Neither, neither is acceptable. Right? Both are very Clausewitzian arguments. Right? So if you think about what's going on here, right? Uh, with this non-Clausewitzian argument. Remember, uh, Clausewitz doesn't talk about whether anything is morally justified uh, or, or whether it violates international law. It's a tool of statecraft. Clausewitz says if John sees an opportunity right, to protect himself in the face of this threat from Mike, or Mike sees a threat to protect himself in the face of a threat from John, Mike and John can do whatever they want. War, and war is a, it's a tool of statecraft. Let's not get wrapped around the axle about ethics and morals or anything like that. That's the Clausewitzian view. And what you want to understand is that the view that almost all of you, I'm sure, have accepted, right, and the vast majority in the body politic have, accept, have accepted, is a non-Clausewitzian view. And what's going on here is that we are basically trying to subordinate the conduct of international politics to a moral or legal order. You want to think about what's going on. This is very important. Nobody really puts it in these terms. We are subordinating the conduct of international politics to a set of moral and legal precepts. Right? It's really a radical way of thinking about the initiation of war. Right? And it's fundamentally non-Clausewitzian. Right? And the example I like to use to highlight this is the uh, case of Michael, Vol Michael Walzer's famous book on just war theory. Uh, I, I think it's a terrific book. I've used it for years for teaching purposes, even though I, I'm a realist. And the book is a, an attack on realism from the get-go. Uh, if my memory's correct, the first chapter is against realism. That's the title of the chapter. He hates realism, right? Uh, and he would hate what I have said to you over the past 10 minutes. And it's a defense of just war theory. And it's in many ways a brilliant book. But it has a fundamental flaw in it, which uh, I believe shows you why my logic trumps his logic, why realism trusts, trumps Michael Walzer's uh, just war theory. And that is, he, towards the end of the book, um, makes the case that in a supreme emergency, when you're on the ropes, when it looks like you're going down the tubes, you can abandon 
just war theory and act like a realist. That's the Walzer argument, right? And uh, he, he, he's fully aware that this is a very dangerous argument for him to make. And I'll make it clear to you in a second why it's a very dangerous argument for him to make. Because he's leaving a narrow crack in the door open. And you cannot leave a narrow crack in the door open with somebody like me. Because I'll go <laughs> through that. I'll go through that door very quickly. Right? So, so what, what Walzer is saying, you have to be in really dire straits. You have to be on the verge of being finished off. Right? And the threat has to be really of the most serious nature. And then at the last moment, you can turn yourself into a realist and deal with the problem. The problem, the problem in Walzer's argument is who in their right mind would wait to the last minute? <laughs> if you're up against the mortal foe, or if you're not up against the mortal foe, you just think you might be up more against the mortal foe. You've all read Sebastian's work on intentions, right? Sebastian Rosado will tell you intentions are very hard to divine with a high degree of certainty to use his rhetoric. How can I be sure what Mike's intentions will be in 20 or 30 years? I can't know. Do I want to wait until he turns into Godzilla? No. Do I want to deal with him now when he's not Godzilla? And maybe when he's a bit weaker than me, right? So you see the problem that Walzer has. Once you say, you know, once you have a chapter that deals with the subject of supreme emergency, and you say that in a supreme emergency, you can throw just war theory down the toilet, and you can act like a realist, you leave yourself open to the argument that it's better to act like a realist early rather than at the last moment, where if you're dealing with a highly efficient adversary, that adversary will finish you off. Right? So you see, this is why the conduct of international politics uh, can never be uh, subordinated um, to uh, a moral or legal order. It just can't happen. Uh, now, I, I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying that there's no room for moral considerations in international politics. My comments may be read to lead in that direction. That's not my argument. I believe that we are all, realists included, moral human beings. I believe that we all have moral compasses. And I believe those moral compasses influence how we think about the world. OK, I just want to make that clear. You understand why I placed all this emphasis on basic realist logic. But I believe at the same time we think about the world, or at least people like Mike and I think about the world in realist terms, we also have, each of us, a moral compass. And the interesting question you want to ask yourself is how does that realist worldview mesh with that set of moral precepts that guide your thinking about international politics? And my argument is there are three possible scenarios. The first is what the moral compass says you should do and the realist compass says you should do line up. And you have no problem fighting a war even maybe initiating a war, right, if the moral compass and the realist compass line up. And they actually do quite often in international politics. You can do things for realist reasons that make sense from a moral point of view. Fighting against Adolf Hitler in World War II, I think it was the morally correct thing to do. Trying to contain the Soviet Union during the Cold War, I think it was the morally correct thing to do. I could point to other examples. So the arrows sometimes line up. There are other cases, this is the second scenario, where moral precepts, where, excuse me, where realist precepts just don't apply. During the unipolar moment, there's a genocide in Rwanda. You can easily deal with that genocide from a moral perspective because there are no realist considerations involved. It, it, it has no effect on the balance of power. It has nothing to do with great power politics. So there are 
quite a few cases in international politics, certainly during the unipolar moment, but even uh, in a bipolar or multipolar world, where the balance of power is not affected by the use of military force for moral reasons. Then we come to the third possibility, which is the trick. What happens if moral precepts and realist precepts are at odds with each other? What if your moral compass says do this and your realist compass says do the opposite? <coughs> Regrettably, you'll do what your realist compass says every time. And the reason you will is because of the nature of international politics and the fact that we operate in an anarchic system. We operate in an international anarchy where you have no choice. So my argument is that just war theory and international law, uh, although they are both noble enterprises, and in certain circumstances they make good sense, when it comes to questions of war of peace, there is no way that the conduct of international politics can ever be subordinated to them. Okay, let me go to the third part of my talk and uh, then I'll stop. Uh, remember I said to you, uh, according to Clausewitz, war is an extension of politics by other means. And this is just another way of saying War is subordinated to politics, right? Politics is the main driving force, and war is subordinated to it. But as I said to you in the setup comments, when you actually get into a war in the modern world, there's a very powerful tendency for those two things to be flipped and for politics to become subordinated to military considerations. And this matters greatly for limited wars, and I'll make clear why that's the case in a minute. If you're going to fight a limited war, you want to keep it limited, it's very important that politics be in the driver's seat, that policymakers, civilian policymakers, be in charge and not military commanders, right? But the tendency pushes in the other direction when you're fighting limited wars. Limited wars tend to escalate. Right? And this really matters in the nuclear world. Uh, I think if nuclear weapons are ever used, they will be used in a limited fashion. We can talk more about this in the Q&A if you'd like, because uh, I can tell you how I think nuclear weapons would be used if the United States had had to use them in the Cold War, if the Russians used them in Ukraine. Uh, they will use them in limited fashion, as we would have used them in limited fashion during uh, the Cold War. Uh, had the, Soviets or the Warsaw Pact more generally overrun West Germany. So you'll start with a limited nuclear war. Uh, let's hope that never happens, but that's where you start, which is a good thing. But once that limited nuclear war starts, you do not want it escalating. You want to do everything you can to shut it down, to be honest. But if you don't shut it down, you want to keep it limited and then shut it down, right? And for that to happen, politics has to be in the driver's seat, in my opinion. Okay. Now, Question is, why is John arguing that you have this tendency for politics to become subordinated to military considerations? There are a handful of reasons. First has to do with military leaders. Very important to understand, and this is quite well documented, military leaders like to win decisive victories. This is another way of saying military leaders do not like limited wars. They don't like limited wars for two reasons. They want to go in and win quickly and decisively to minimize the number of their troops who get killed, but also because they are in charge of national security. They are in charge of defending the state. They are in charge of fighting and dying to protect the state. And if there's a threat out there, they'd like to finish that threat off once and for all. Winning a limited victory means that you leave your adversary intact, right? So military leaders like decisive victories. They don't like limited victories. Furthermore, military leaders do not like civilians telling them how to conduct the war. Military leaders 
think they are the professionals. They know how the profession of arms works. These civilians are a bunch of dinglings, and they're just going to get us in trouble if they're in charge. And the best way to avoid this is that once the war starts, all responsibility is turned over to us military leaders, or we military leaders. We'll execute the war. We'll win a decisive victory. And then we'll turn control back over to the policymakers. Right? And I have some quotes in the paper where there are actually generals making this argument. So you see, military leaders, number one, like decisive victories. That cuts against limited war. Number two, military leaders don't like civilians in the decision-making process. And it's civilians or policymakers who keep wars limited. Right? So the military is a big problem here. Well, let's put it in a slightly more uh, cautious way. There's a real tendency for trouble from the military if you get into a war. Second force that pushes for escalation, which I've touched on already, is nationalism. Uh, nationalism, huge problem for escalation. This is written all over Clausewitz's famous tract, On War. Just go to book eight of On War. What nationalism allows you to do is raise a mass army, and it allows you to value infuse that army in ways where almost everybody hates the other. And in fact, inside the broader society at large, people are value infused to hate the other. Nationalism turns into hyper-nationalism. I'm sure this is easy for all of you to understand, right? And the reason that France was so hard to beat, it took roughly six balancing coalitions to finish off France. The war started in 1792. The French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars started in 1792, and they ran to 1815. That's 23 years. It took 23 years to finish off the French. This is what Napoleon's writing about in Book 8 of On War. He saw Napoleon up, cl up close. He saw the French army up close. It was, it was an army that was built on nationalism. It was the nation in arms. Think about the nation in arms. It was a really powerful force. And it was bent on dominating all of Europe. And this is why Clausewitz is very, very important for making the argument that war's natural tendency is to escalate to the absolute level. And I believe this is why Clausewitz says that war is an extension of politics by other means. He wants to make it clear that policymakers should put limits on it because he understood how powerful the tendency was to escalate uh, to absolute war. So nationalism is a huge problem in keeping wars limited. Um, there are other ideologies that matter, right? First of all, you get a case where you have Nazi Germany up against fascist Germany. It's, you know, it gets communist Soviet Union. Fascist Germany, Nazi Germany up against the communist Soviet Union. Right? That is going to push the war to escalate. Uh, and you have nationalism in that case as well. Uh, then you have other ideologies like the United States. Right? The United States is a liberal state. It has a crusader mentality. Uh, if the United States is in a world where there are not many checks on its ability to use military force, it'll be running all over the world uh, trying to turn countries into democracies, right? Um, and then finally, you get uh, eliminationist ideologies like Nazism. It was eliminationist ideology. So you can see in addition to nationalism, you have this other ideological dimension. And the point that I'm trying to make to you is that what this does is that it pushes states uh, to pursue uh, total victory. And then finally, in comes the dynamics of war. Dynamics of war. Uh, first of all, if you win a limited victory, you're going to launch a limited war, you win a limited victory, in many cases, you're then infected by the victory disease. The victory disease says, hmm, I did pretty well this first time. Let's escalate and 
do something else. You know, we originally, when we entered the Korean War, our goal was to push the North Koreans back to the 38th parallel. But then MacArthur launched this brilliant offensive that resulted in the landing at Incheon, and we won this stunning victory, and he and the Truman administration decided that we should cross the 38th parallel and head up towards the Yellow River, right? This is the victory disease. So the point is, talking about the dynamics of war here, that even if you win a limited victory, right, you sometimes are tempted to expand uh, your success. Then there's the whole question if you fail. If you launch a limited war, you fail, right? Then there's a powerful incentive to up the ante so that you could rescue the situation, right? And then finally, there's the phenomenon that Alex Downs talks about in his brilliant book on civilian victimization and war, which is that when you get into a protracted war, when a country gets into a protracted war, it's not on the verge of winning a quick victory. It almost automatically uh, goes on a rampage and starts murdering large numbers of civilians uh, because the view is that's a good way to get out of this protracted war. That's the solution, right, to turn to uh, killing large numbers of people. For those of you who haven't looked at Downs' book, you should really look at it. Because Downs, by the way, concludes that there's no difference between democracies and non-democracies. In fact, he argues, if anything, democracies are more likely to behave in barbaric fashion than non-democracies. But the point is, if you're in a war, you're in a modern war, and your side is stymied, and you're looking for a way out, what invariably happens is you turn to killing huge numbers of civilians. Just think about uh, the use of the atomic bombs against Japan in World War II. Japan was on its knees in early August 1945. It was kaput, right? And we thought that to get it to finally surrender, we might have to invade the Japanese home islands. And the thought of invading the Japanese home islands was so antithetical to American policymakers, both in the military and uh, in, in uh, Washington, that we dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan. We, we, the, again, the war was won by August 1945. Japan was on its deathbed. But we couldn't get them to say, I quit. Couldn't get them to say, I quit. And uh, we did not want to join, we did not want to invade the Japanese home islands. So to avoid those American casualties, this is the Downs point about protracted wars, to avoid those <coughs> American casualties, we dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan. And, uh, but anyway, so just my bottom line here is that given the interests of military leaders and how they think about the conduct of war, in terms of their views of decisive victories and civilian interference in the enterprise, given nationalism, given other ideologies, and given the dynamics of war, it is difficult to keep wars limited in the modern age. And my argument is that this is of enormous importance when you live in a nuclear world. It's of enormous importance when you live in a non-nuclear world. But it's of even greater importance when you live in a nuclear world because it's important that we keep that war limited. This is why you want to pay a lot of attention moving forward uh, to understanding the dynamics of escalation. And you want to think about how war ceases to be, right? War ceases to be subordinate to politics in these situations, and that's not a good thing. My conclusion, very quickly, is that conflict is endemic to politics. Conflict is endemic to politics. And to put it in slightly different terms, war is endemic to international politics. This is John's main message. Conflict is endemic to politics. War is endemic to international politics. And once war is endemic to international politics, fear, fear is in the air. Fear that your survival is threatened. Remember, fear that your survival is threatened. There's no Leviathan. There's no night watchman. 
And once survival is on the table, we're in a Clausewitzian world. Don't tell me you can't have preventive wars. Don't tell me you can't have wars of opportunity. Because in a world where survival, survival is under threat, those two kinds of war, however regrettable this is, they are on the table. Bottom line, war can never be eliminated from international politics. And political considerations will always trump economic considerations, legal considerations, and moral considerations when they are in conflict. Thank you. for offensive reels. It's, it's your theory of, uh, um, you, you said, calculated aggression in, in the book, the words of, 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 words of opportunity, <laughs> or Sebastian's or, or Dale Copeland's uh, preventive war. I think there is some inherent contradiction between the two, like offensive reels explanation of the origin of a great power war. And second, I think with Peter Campbell, right, wrote the book in 2020, 2020 arguing against the, the traditional commercial wisdom that the military leaders are, say, uh, less like, re uh, like, uh, real, real, uh, like realists than the civilian leaders. He made two arguments. First, the uh, military leaders are often, uh, they believe in uh, the core concept of realism more than civilian leaders. And second, they are often on the driver's seat of changing military policy. Like, how do you see this kind of a new challenge? Don't sit down. Let me just ask you a question. You talked about preventive war and wars of opportunity, and you said there's a contradiction there? I mean, I wasn't sure what your first point was. Like, who, who speaks for, uh, like, offensive real, real theory uh, of uh, origin of great power wars? Uh, well, I, I would just say to you that the argument I tried to make today, and I think most realists would agree with, is that those are two distinct kinds of wars, wars of opportunity and preventive wars. I don't think we disagree there. And almost any realist could uh, or, or can or does say that those two kinds of wars exist. I think, just to take Dale, I think Dale focuses much more on preventive war than anyone else. Uh, I think as an offensive realist, I focus more on wars of opportunity than I do on preventive wars, which I think is getting to what your question is, that these different people think about these things differently. Uh, but, you know, there's no reason that you can't think uh, in terms of both. In the book that Sebastian and I wrote, uh, which is very interesting, relevant to his question, uh, Sebastian and I did the World War I case. Uh, this is the July crisis in 1914. And I had long argued, don't tell anybody this, that it was a war of opportunity, that really I thought Germany was going for the whole enchilada. But after Sebastian and I spent endless hours going over the case, I think I was wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was a preventive war, uh, and, and, I, and, and I think Dale is right on that one. Uh, but anyway, I just think these are two logics, and one can emphasize one more than the other, but they fit neatly in, in the realist canon. Although there are realists like Mike who basically believe that neither one make any sense in the modern world. Uh, I'm not picking on him here, but I think it just shows you the point that I tried to make early on, that there are differences uh, among people on this. Uh, and your second question was about the military and their attitude towards war. And what was the basic point that you were making there? Yeah, it's basically uh, Peter Campbell, uh, Peter Campbell's like 2020 book, I think uh, uh, Professor Dash advice uh, he sees this. Yeah, so there are two arguments. First, firstly, like military leaders, 
often believe in uh, logic realism more than civilian leaders. And secondly, they are often on the driver's seat of national security policy. That's why you see like the U.S. Uh, uh, military policy in the Cold War are broadly aligned with like realist principle. Okay, I'm just going to make one quick point just so we can get to other people. I want to be clear here that my argument is not that military leaders are more interested in fighting wars than civilians are. There's this widespread belief, I believe, in the West that militaries love to initiate wars, and thank God we have the civilians, which, by the way, is consistent with my argument, the limited war argument, that you want policymakers uh, in the driver's seat. The argument here, right, is that policymakers don't want to go to war, civilian policymakers, and it's these warmongers in uniform. Actually, I think the opposite is the case. I think civilians are really, in most cases, not all, the warmongers, and the military is a break on going in. And the key book on this is Dick Betts's book, Statesmen, what is it? States soldiers, Statesmen, Cold War Crisis. Yeah, Soldiers, Statesmen, and Cold War Crisis by Richard K. Betts. That, that was the lecture I gave at Columbia. It was Dick's first book. It was this Harvard PhD dissertation. And Dick's bottom line is that militaries are less reluctant, or, excuse me, they're more reluctant to initiate war. But once they get into a war, they want to go for the whole enchilada. They want, as I said, decisive victory. Rose, good. John, good to see you. Um, Likewise. So I'm interested in your definition of politics. And I like it. It sounds very Schmidtian. Um, this idea that it's about fundamental differences that can lead to conflict, right? It, it is, ve it is yeah. very Schmidtian, as in Carl Schmidt, Carl Schmidt concept of the political. Right. Um, but that seems to be in tension with Clausewitz and the way that you talk about Clausewitz and political decisions as having to be above military decisions. And the problem with escalation is that military stuff starts to conform to its own logic, right? The logic of war beyond what makes sense for political circumstances. But if you have a definition of politics that has conflict baked in and that has politicians who are managers of politics engaging in politics as a contact sport. And that if the heart of politics is about being angry enough, having enough fundamental differences that people would fight each other and kill each other, then how does that accord with Clausewitz? It seems like, you know, it, it seems like it's intentional with your idea that, and Clausewitz's idea, which I agree with, um, that political managers can pull us back from sort of the absolute wars that, that can happen with the total war second. So the idea is that there's this constant competition uh, that can turn deadly and escalate, and it might even lead to absolute war or total war. And what I'm arguing is that uh, it's very important for the policymakers to be in the driver's seat so they can set limited goals. Or in those cases where they set limited goals, it's very important that they be in the driver's seat to keep the war limited. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that's my argument. And what's the problem that you see? Just if politicians, so military leaders are managers of violence, right? Politicians are managers of the national interest, right? They're acting in a sort of different way, right? But you've defined politics as being about conflict. You've defined politics as the possibility that you know you have these fundamental differences where people can get angry at each other, yeah, yeah, they can hate each yeah. other, they can kill each other, blah, blah. A politician, presumably, is an expert in politics. And that's a very violent view of politics. So why would the politician not fall into the same trap as the military? Be because as a policymaker, you just want to keep a war limited because it makes good political sense. You're in charge of national security broadly defined. And an unlimited war is something that you don't want. I mean, just to go to Joe Biden and dealing with Iran, uh, I mean, I do not think, or Joe Biden dealing with Ukraine, right? Joe Biden did not want to get into a war with Russia. Right? He wanted to keep the war in Ukraine limited. Uh, 
If he uses military force, Joe Biden, against the Houthis or against Iran, let's say, you know, in the days ahead that he launches a limited set of attacks against Iran, he is going to want to keep that limited. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And the one of the dangers that he faces, I mean, one is the nationalism argument. The nationalism argument is these guys killed Americans. Those are our people, right? That's the nationalism argument. But the other thing is the military, they're going to want to take the gloves off in all likelihood, right? You know, military people have been killed, right? If you're going to go in, look, look, Joe, if we go in there, we want to hammer these people. We want to defeat them. We want to eliminate the Houthi threat, right? This is the problem that you run into. But I, I don't see... Politi I see politicians, I see, my, politicians a bad word, I see policymakers who represent the political class in a very difficult situation, in part because of nationalism, part because of nationalism, but also in part because of dealing with the military. That's my, that's my argument. Thank you, Professor Mary Sharman, and Colleen Jones, and Hagen. Uh, I had a question. Uh, regarding your point about the increased lethality, lethality of war decreasing the likelihood of conflict, and I wanted to know your opinion on whether or not great powers are increasingly invulnerable, and if so, uh, does that mean that the intrinsic components of the state are, have increased in importance? I'm inspired by Caitlin Talmadge's work on coup proofing and how some regimes look inwards for threat rather than outwards, uh, and if you have any thoughts on that as well. But, but just start over again. What was the basic point? Because of the lethal lethality. increased lethality of war. Okay. Yes, and what does that do? Uh, decrease the likelihood. Of Decreases the likelihood. Okay. Are you disagreeing with that? I, no. I'm just trying to... Okay. But So what is the argument? That if it decreases the likelihood of war, then it means that great powers have a greater incentive to look inwards for threats rather than outwards. But the point that this is what the first part I tried to make, it decreases the likelihood, okay? But the threat is there. That, that's the point. And by the way, Rose, this is the Schmidt point too, right? It's the idea that war is sitting there in the background, right? <laughs> It's, it's that threat that you, you can never take your eye off the ball. That's not a very good way of putting it, but you get what I mean, right? You just, you constantly have to pay attention to the possibility, right, that you will end up in a war. So you, there's no question that the, the intensity of the competition varies from case to case. I don't want to get too carried away here, but it's the ever-present possibilities there which limits your ability to look inward. You wrote a piece, my, this is Mike, Mike Desch, wrote a, a fascinating piece when the Cold War ended, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you argued that once the Cold War is over with and you're in the unipolar moment, there is no external threat and you can look inward. And his argument was that this is going to cause all sorts of problems. This is the centrifugal forces, right? This is the argument that in an immigrant culture like the United States, if you think about this, well, first of all, let's just go back to what I said about politics. Politics is a contact sport, different interests. You can never get anybody to agree on anything. That's an exaggeration, but you know what I'm saying. So that's point one. Point two is if you have an immigrant culture, right, you're going to have additional centrifugal forces because you're bringing all sorts of people into the body politic who have not been socialized, and they have to be socialized, right? And one of the ways in a liberal democracy like the United States, with as many people as we have, the diversity we have, the immigration we have, one of the ways of dealing with those centrifugal forces is to have an external enemy, right? Again, Schmidt, back to Rose, right? An external enemy. And Mike's argument was there was no external enemy, right? <laughs> and didn't one of the Soviet leaders say, you're going to really miss the Soviet Union, right? 
because it had this. We're going to do the worst thing to you. We're going to deprive you of an enemy. Yes. Did, did you hear what Mike said? We're going to do the worst. This one Soviet leader said to us after the Cold War ended, we're going to do the worst thing to you. We're going to deprive you of an enemy. Anyway, but so that's actually a situation in the early years of the Cold War where I think your logic applied. But my argument, remember, my argument is great power politics is back on the table. Right, and in a world where great power politics is back on the table, right? I think your argument is moot, but I think it applies in that case. Thank Sir, Steve Radjic, United States Army, retired. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for sharing your wisdom. Uh, it's much appreciated. From that period, 1939 to 1945, uh, what issues, what decisions, um, what policies, if any? Uh, would help us today to resolve some of the, uh, the issues that we're talking about. 1939. I'm not sure uh, what the answer to that would be. Uh, uh, I mean, the one thing that strikes me about that period versus the present is that we're in a multipolar world, uh, and that was a multipolar world. Uh, and uh, I was born, and a lot of the older dogs like you, Mike, uh, we were all born in the, uh, we, were born, we were born in a bipolar world. So all my understanding of great power politics was developed, true for you folks too, was developed uh, in, uh, in a bipolar world. Then we went to unipolarity. Now we're in a multipolar world, and um, the, uh, the 1939-1945 case was a multipolar world. And what makes it very interesting is that during, during the run-up to World War II and in the conduct of World War II, uh, there were two areas of the world that we cared about and there were two great powers that we cared about. One was Japan in East Asia and two was Germany in Europe. Of course, the Soviet Union mattered, but Germany was seen as the principal threat. So we had to deal with two threats at the same time. And then once the war broke out, we had to fight two wars, right? And this was a real balancing act. Roosevelt, by the way, was a genius. I think one of the great strategic geniuses of all time. Um, uh, but anyway, today, if you look at the situation we face, right, we face a Chinese threat, we face a Russian threat, because we've turned it into a Russian threat. I don't think it's a serious threat, but there's a Russian threat that we're dealing with, a Chinese threat, they're the two great powers, right? And then there's the Middle East. And one of my favorite arguments these days is that the principal threat that the United States has to deal with today is China. And the last thing you wanna do, if you have to deal with China, is you wanna be bogged down in the Middle East thinking about attacking Iran? Are you kidding me? This is the last thing we need to do. The threat is in Asia. Furthermore, there's Ukraine. What in God's name are we doing in Eastern Europe? It just doesn't matter. The idea that the Russians are a potential hegemon, a peer competitor, come on. Stuck in Eastern Ukraine. They can't even get out of Eastern Ukraine. I'm gonna worry about them. I'm worried about China. So you see the balancing act here? Furthermore, to take it a step further, let's go back to World War II. The genius of Roosevelt, and this was not due solely to Roosevelt, is that we formed an alliance with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union paid the principal blood price to defeat Nazi Germany. It was very clear from World War I that to defeat Nazi Germany in World War II was going to involve an enormous blood price. And the question is, who was going to pay that blood price, right? And one of the principal driving forces behind appeasement in Britain was that the British said, we don't want to pay that price. We've been there, done that, and it did not work out very well. Well, it was the Soviet Union that paid the blood price. You all know that roughly 24 million Soviet citizens died in World War II. That's military plus civilians, right? 
unbelievable, unbelievable blood price. When we land on the beaches at Normandy on June 6, 1944, this is less than one year before the war ends. The war ends in Europe on May 8, 1945. We land on the beaches at Normandy, June 6, 1944. That's less than a year before the war ends. At that point in time, 92% of all German casualties were on the Eastern Front. 92%. They paid the blood price. What am I saying? If you're the United States of America, you want to ally with Nazi Germany. You want to ally with Nazi Germany. This is one of those cases where you're doing kind of the morally incorrect thing, align, excuse me, ally with the Soviet Union. You, want to, you end up aligning with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, right? Fast forward to the present. Instead of aligning with Russia, having Russia as an ally to help us contain China, because of the Ukraine war, we have foolishly pushed the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. Right. So when I look at what we did between 1939 and 1945, I find it hard to see a mistake that Roosevelt made. And I could go on and on about this, but I won't. But I, I, can, I see evidence of hardly a mistake that he made. He played it perfectly. Uh, in terms of fighting a two-front war, and in terms of allying with the Soviet Union, even though it was the morally incorrect thing to do, because it was imperative to defeat Nazi Germany. If you look at American policy today, I think we ought to pay more attention to thinking about priorities, right, and the importance of focusing on Asia, and not focusing on the Middle East, not focusing on Europe, and forming an alliance with the Russians to contain the Chinese. But that's not going to happen. Yes. This. Thank you so much for the talk today. So I'm writing a thesis on civil conflict. And I was wondering if you had, I know this talk is all about international war, multipolarity. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts or lessons you think you could extend from these concepts to concepts of civil war, preventing them, pre preventing them from occurring. The only thing I'll say about civil war, which I don't know much about, and I've learned over the years it's not good to talk about things you don't know much about, <laughs> especially when you have a high profile, because <laughs> people remember the foolish things that you said. What I would say about civil wars is civil conflict is an excellent illustration of my point that politics is a contact sport, OK? Remember what I said. Politics is a contact sport. But in the context of a state, inside the black box where you are, right? inside the black box, you have the Leviathan. You have the night watchman. And that's what protects people. And that's fundamentally different than the international system where there's no higher authority. That was my argument. But the fact that you're studying civil conflict tells us that even when you have a night watchman, and even when you have a Leviathan, war or conflict still breaks out, which just goes to show you how intense and how much enmity there can be inside the black box. It shows you that politics is a combat sport. Conflict. Uh, is all about combat, intellectual or combat of one sort or another. Contact sport, sorry. But that's not to say that that happens all the time, right? Uh, but it's always there, right? And that, that's why you want to stay. Uh, thank you, Professor. My name is Josh. Um, earlier you said that once we're in a period of war, it's much easier to rationalize military action. Um, what do you think about the idea that... I, I don't understand what that means. Sorry. Can, can, once we're in a period of war... Yeah, like just kind of what, when you, what you were saying earlier, like when we're in a period of conflict, it's easier to, like, uh, uh, offensive action or even just action, military action in general, is much uh, easier to, I would say, convince of, like, to convince to the public, convince of to the general population, the country. Like, once you're in a period of war, people are, are generally more nationalistic, I would say. Uh, they want to win the war, like that. Like you were, like you were talking about earlier, your point to generals, right? The generals like wanting to win the war decisively. So I w wanted to ask, um, 
what do you think about the idea of the military industrial complex um, actively like wanting to keep us in a state of war, prolong, like pro, a prolonged state of war, um, yeah. like as an industry? Like what, what do you think about yeah, that idea? Yeah, great question. I, I get asked this question uh, occasionally, and I, uh, I always give an answer that my, uh, the audience finds unsatisfactory. Um, but go, my answer goes like this. I think there's no question that the military industrial complex, let's call it the MIC, the MIC has an interest in security competition uh, because the more security competition there is, the more need there is for an arms buildup. Um, but in terms of <coughs> initiating war, and even initiating a security competition, I've never seen much evidence that the MIC matters that much. Uh, when I was your age, uh, the international relations literature was broken up into three parts. There were the realists, there were the liberals, and both of those groups are still here. And today, there's the social constructivists. They're the third group. There was no such thing as social constructivists when I was your age, there were Marxists. Uh, I know you find that hard to believe, but it is true. There were real Marxists. Uh, uh, I, I used to know a huge amount of Marxist literature. I took a course in graduate school on Marxist theories of the state. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, so Marxism was one of the three bodies of literature. And there were some people in that bailiwick who tried to make the argument, unsurprisingly, that it was the Mick that was really driving American foreign policy. And uh, I looked at a lot of those pieces and I read a lot of the counter arguments and I think it's just very hard to make the argument that the MIC matters that much. Uh, and uh, if you can find the piece that you know, makes the argument that the MIC is really uh, driving America's aggressive behavior abroad, uh, I be more than happy to sort of read it and change my mind if it was a convincing argument. But I've just not seen a, a lot of evidence that the MIC matters that much. And just one final point, I'm not arguing it doesn't matter at all. That would be a stupid argument to make. It matters somewhat. But I think there are other considerations that drive foreign policy. This is an argument you would expect from a realist like me, right? And then when you go back to the unipolar moment, go back to the unipolar moment, as you know, John's argument is that it was liberal ideology, crusader state, that was really driving the train. So you see me bouncing back and forth, liberal ideology in the unipolar moment, and bipolarity and multipolarity, realist logic. And I'm staying away from, for lack of a better phrase, the Marxist argument or the Mick argument. Uh, so that's my thinking on that one. <coughs> Last of all, physics professor, my question is, is it a purely preventive war? Uh, my example is 1999, NATO bombarded Serbia. And uh, the argument was that to, to protest the civilians in Kosovo. But actually, the other opinion is that they wanted to have a strategic military base, NATO base in Kosovo. I'm not sure that's a preventive war. I mean, a preventive war, just go to, back to me and Mike, is that uh, I'm very fearful that Mike is going to grow much more powerful. And because I can't know Mike's intentions, I want to cut him off at the knees now. I'm preventing him from becoming a threat. Your story seems to me, this is the unipolar moment. There's really no threat in Europe. Right, There's, the Soviet Union is gone. Russia's, you know, on its knees at the time of the Kosovo War, right? But what you're saying is that I pick on a small power uh, just because I want to uh, have uh, a NATO base uh, in Kosovo. Uh, I, I think that's possible, but that's just—it's just a different logic. Does that make sense? You define the uh, unipolar moment as starting around 2017, but so do you think that U.S. policymakers have embraced 
the uh, the end of the unipolar moment, or are we still thinking in terms of the United States being the preeminent power, or they're just being yeah, like, more yeah. bipolar? Yeah, yeah. Did every, everybody hear his question? Yeah, OK. Excellent question. Uh, you know, 2017 is when Trump comes to power. And Trump jettisons our policy of engagement towards China. And he develops a hard-nosed containment policy. OK? Uh, and uh, a lot of people argue that if Trump came to power in 2017, and unipolarity ends in 2017, and he abandoned engagement in favor of containment, it's Donald Trump who's responsible for the end of unipolarity. That's not an argument a realist like me would ever make, because for me, unipolarity, bipolarity, multipolarity, these are, uh, th these distinctions are a function of the structure of the system. It's a function of the growth of Chinese power and the resurrection of Russian power under Vladimir Putin, right? that by about 2017 creates a world where in relative terms, relative balance of power, dot, 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 China and Russia are back in the game, or Russia's back in the game, and China is in the game for the first time in centuries, right? So you then have three great powers. But it has to do with the wealth and population size and the military might of these countries. It's not um, Donald Trump. And the interesting case here is Joe Biden. And we'll talk about the Chinese case. Uh, Joe Biden was, as the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as vice president, an arch proponent of engagement with China. He thought that this is based on the liberal policies. The idea was that you could help China get rich, help it get prosperous, integrate it into international institutions. It would become a responsible stakeholder. And as it grew more prosperous, it would turn into a democracy. This was what engagement was all about. A realist like me, I argued for a long time. Everybody thought I was crazy, but I argued for a long time. This is a remarkably foolish policy. The idea that you would help China grow into a very powerful country when you can't know its intentions. And in fact, I know what its intentions will be, right? Uh, and furthermore, how do you know it's going to become a democracy? And as you all have noticed, it has not become a democracy. So anyway, Trump jettisoned engagement. Trump lasts for four years and uh, Biden comes into power in 2020. So the question is, what does Biden do? Does Biden go back to engagement, or does he follow in the footsteps of Trump? And actually, what he does is he doubles down on Trump. He's actually tougher on the Chinese than Trump was, right? And this, I think, is supports my structural argument, right? My realist argument that it, it, it's not so much Biden's beliefs, right? He believed in engagement at one point, but China had become powerful enough by the time he moved into the White House in January 2017 that he had to pursue uh, uh, containment. Now, just one other point on this. And it bears on your question, which is a fascinating question. Uh, Ukraine. I believe that the Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine war, is a vestige of the unipolar moment. And it's when liberal ideas were in the driver's seat, right? The liberal ideas that underpinned engagement, underpinned underpin the Ukraine war. Now, you're saying to yourself, why is John saying that? Well, the start of the trouble in Ukraine is the famous April 2008 Bucharest NATO summit. Remember, George Bush gets defeated. He doesn't get defeated. He runs out of his two terms in November 2008, and Obama wins. 
So George is going out in January 2009. Uh, he wants to leave uh, a legacy. And in April 2008, he pushes NATO expansion into Georgia and into Ukraine down the throats of Angela Merkel and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and the Europeans more generally. They do not want to bring Ukraine into NATO. But Bush wants to. So that's when we decide to do it. It's very important to understand that there is no evidence I have ever seen that it was designed to contain Russia. We did not consider Russia a threat at the time. What we were trying to do was we were trying to spread institutions like NATO and the EU eastward on the belief that we would integrate these countries into these institutions, they would become responsible stakeholders, we would spread the EU eastward, people would get hooked on capitalism, they would get prosperous, would reinforce democracy. Remember we had the color revolutions, the orange revolution in Ukraine, the rose revolution in uh, Georgia, all designed to promote democracy. So if you talk to Mike McFaul, right, who I disagree in fundamental ways with on this whole subject of Ukraine, he will tell you that he was, he was although he's a Stanford professor, he was the US ambassador to, uh, uh, to Russia. Mike will tell you that he talked to Putin and told Putin that he had nothing to fear from NATO expansion, that the United States is a benign hegemon and it was basically spreading liberalism eastward and it wanted to create a giant zone of peace in Europe where Eastern Europe looked just like Western Europe. It was kind of a seamless web. That was the goal. It's not until the crisis breaks out in 2014, February 2014, when we switch gears and all of a sudden Vladimir Putin is a really serious threat, right? That's 2014. But anyway, uh, what you see here, right, is that the Ukraine crisis, which broke out in 2014 and continues to this day, has its genesis in that April 2008 decision. And it was the unipolar moment. That's 2008, the unipolar moment. It's when liberalism was in the driver's seat, right? And the problem that you face, this is you know, a huge problem for the United States. I learned this when I was a kid during the Vietnam War. You know, it's one of the main lessons I took from the Vietnam War. It's very easy for the United States to get into a conflict. It is very hard to get out, right? Once you start shooting, you know, getting out is really tough. Think Afghanistan, 20 years. And the problem with Ukraine is it blew up in 2014. So John writes his piece. This is the piece that you were referring to that I wrote in 2014. John says, we should back off here, right? <laughs> this is going to lead to no good, right? But we double down, right? We're still in the unipolar moment, but we're, you know, heading out of it. We double down. And, and by the way, one of the reasons we double down is it's the unipolar moment. We think we're Godzilla. We're so powerful. Screw the Russians. They're protesting. By the way, NATO expansion, first tranche, 1999. Russians scream bloody murder. What did we do? We ignored them, just pushed on. 2004, second tranche of NATO expansion. And this included the Baltic states, right? Russians scream bloody murder. What do we do? Shove it down their throat, move on. April 2008, Putin screams bloody murder. He's just to show you what good friends we were with Putin in 2008 and that NATO expansion into Ukraine and Georgia was not aimed at Putin. Putin, not, not aimed at Putin. Putin was at Bucharest. We were playing kissy face with him at Bucharest, right? We didn't see him as a great threat. We just thought we were Godzilla. Shove it down his throat, right? You all know that two countries were going to come in April 2008. We said Georgia and Ukraine will come in. A war broke out in Georgia in August of 2008 on this very issue. People like me said, oh my God, right? The Russians are serious. Putin wasn't blowing smoke. Then the war breaks out in Ukraine, the low level war, in February of 2014, February 22nd, 2014. I say, this is what I say, 
time to back off. This is you know, going to lead to no good, right? The Russians are deadly serious. But we're in, we're in the fight now, right? Getting out? You think we're getting out of Ukraine? You think we're getting out of the Middle East? We're seeking into the deep muddy. You know the deep muddy, Pete Seeger? You remember Pete? You're all too young to remember. You, know, you probably are too young to remember Pete Seeger. I heard about him. I read about him in history. This gentleman looks like he remembers Pete Seeger. Sinking into the deep muddy, right? We're in the deep muddy in the Middle East. We're in the deep muddy in Ukraine, right? I just make well, I know you want to get out of here. Uh, will you give me one more minute? Please, please. Uh, we're going to have one heck of a time getting out of both of these places. You look at the Middle East, it's just, you know, going up and up and up. And these people are going to fight back, right? And for us to just sort of say, this is the end, we're getting out of here, good luck. Anyway, uh, I just want to say, before you say anything, thank you all uh, for coming and listening to me. Thanks for the great questions. I thoroughly enjoyed this, and I'd stay for another half hour if it wasn't for this guy. <laughs> thank you very much.